I talk about p-hacking all the time, but just to refresh you, it's that thing where a scientist manipulates the data uh, to make it look like they got a statistically significant result when in fact they just got a bunch of baloney. But I don't remember if I've ever actually mentioned one of its most prominent uh, adherents, if you will, uh, Brian Wansink of the Cornell Food and Brand Lab. So please allow me to correct this oversight uh, and point out how shady his research is. It's so shady that he was put in his place by the joy of cooking. Yes, the cookbook. Uh, yes, the one that your mother has. Trust me, she has it, uh, even if she's not around anymore. Uh, every time a baby is born, the mother is given, you know, like a blanket, a little beanie for its head and the joy of cooking. And now the joy of cooking has given us a delightful scientific drama. I read about all of this in The New Yorker, so shout out to Helen Rosner, who wrote about this actually way back in March, but I only read about it this week. Uh, in fact, she wrote about it about a month after BuzzFeed published an investigation into Wan Sing's shady practices. Uh, but I know this because uh, Rosner mentions it in her article. She references this very thing for a reason I'll point out in a second, but also because it's been in my folder of stuff to make YouTube videos about for the past 10 months. So let's get into it. Uh, the TLDR is that Wansink has for years been grabbing headlines with catchy pop science research. Like you may have heard about the one where he used a bottomless soup bowl in order to show that people will just keep eating and eating and eating, presumably uh, until they explode like a goldfish or that guy in that Monty Python skit who ate that wafer thin mint. Um, but for almost as long as he's been getting these headlines, statisticians and other researchers have been highly skeptical of his all too tidy findings. Because good science is messy. You know, I remember, uh, you know, in an early rather bad algebra class uh, I had as a kid, I would know that I found the right number when it worked out to something nice and even. If I did a long ass formula and I wound up with 15.979932, I was probably screwing something up. But by the time I hit a pretty good calculus class, it was the opposite. Working out a long equation and finding that the answer is 100 was a sign that something was wrong uh, because it's never that simple and pretty in real life. Most research, especially tricky social science research involving difficult to control humans, <clears throat> is the same, messy. But Wansing's findings were always tied up in a neat little bow. And the more other researchers examined his practices and the way that he processed his data, the more they found that it was a whole lot of bullshit. Read the BuzzFeed articles if you'd like some more background on all of that. What I didn't know <clears throat> back when that all came out is that Wansink had used the joy of cooking in one of his studies, claiming to show that since the uh, cookbook was originally published back in 1936, uh, in each progressive uh, volume that was published, uh, it, it, there were more and more calories per serving in each of the recipes. <clears throat> and by the time, you know, it got to the 2000s, you know, we're all a bunch of fatties eating way too much food. Wansin claimed that this was proof that it wasn't just the fast food diet ruining the American waistline, uh, but it was also home cooking that was the problem. The current author of The Joy of Cooking, John Becker, who is descended from the original author, Irma S. Rombauer, uh, took it at face value at the time that the study was published. They hadn't increased the calories on purpose, but he assumed it must be true because a big time researcher at Cornell found that it was true. So who was he to argue? But then the BuzzFeed article came out back in February and Becker realized that Wansink is generally full of shit. So maybe he was in this case too. So Becker decided to do his own informal study by digging into the data that was at, that was at his fingertips and then sending it to other researchers to look at. What he found was that Wansink chose only 18 recipes to examine out of about 4,500. 
Wanson claims that those were the only recipes that were the same from the first edition to the most recent at the time the study was done. But Becker noted that that was a lie or an incredibly stupid misunderstanding that no scientist would ever want to admit to committing. Hundreds of recipes actually made it through from version to version, though often their names would change. Meanwhile, some recipes in Wansing's sample had the same name as older recipes, but were in fact completely different. As with a goulash that was a clear soup with bits of chicken and vegetables in one early edition, but in the later edition was a sausage-filled soup with roux. Uh, completely different soups. So, huge surprise, another case of Brian Wansink manipulating data to get a good headline. Only this time, he fucked with the wrong family institution and got his ass handed to him. It may be true that recipes these days tend to have more calories in them than they used to. Most people are eating more than they should be, whether they're at McDonald's or at Grandma's. But the way to educate people about making healthier choices isn't to just make up data to deride a cookbook that actually happens to be pretty goddamn handy. It just makes people less likely to believe scientists when it comes to food and diets in a time when we're already facing so much ignorance that the majority of people think that they're getting fatter because of genetics or metabolism instead of eating too much, which in the vast, vast majority of cases, that's what it is. We're just eating too much. It's like if a climate scientist or a vaccine researcher was caught manipulating data. You're just giving stupid people ammo. It's not helping anyone.